uh, today's stream where we are going to talk about the job market and um, actually let me pull up my my publications um, let's see what's the name pages no numbers Let me pull up that, uh, my, my publication pipeline and uh, we can use that um, to chat a little bit. Let's see, open recent, there we go, publications. Hmm. So um, w what I want to do uh, today is to um, talk a little bit about um, how to set up your pipeline for um for the job market um because you know when whenever we have uh, discussed pipelines we've been discussing paper pipelines as you know you you know you have a job as a as faculty and you sort of like um, designing your pipeline to achieve your own objectives your school's targets and so on and so forth today i want to talk about um how to design your, your pipeline to improve how attractive you are uh, for uh, an institution. And uh, before I do that, um, I want to state formally that uh, this reflects my uh, own experience and my discussions with uh, colleagues, a junior and senior across multiple institutions and um, does not uh, reflect uh, my current school's uh, policies or uh, or, or proceed some of it may uh, other may, may not okay so I'm, I'm speaking for myself on my personal capacity and not as a director of research of my school um, so and uh, I, I don't want to say this because you know I, I think we we need to have like real conversations among academics tell it, tell it like it is and um, you know and um, and not sort of like have this like rosy pink view of uh, of academia and you know i, I do acknowledge that um, uh, leadership at uh, yazag is very good and therefore um you know i think the recruitment process is um is a nicer experience but it's not like that everywhere else so um how do you design your pipeline for to 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 improve your 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 job chances here um you need to take into account that the market is the job market uh, especially in management is highly stratified that means that there are groups of schools that ha have very very different um hiring uh, uh hiring procedures okay so for some schools, the only thing that matters are uh, papers published in the top five journals in your field. Um, other schools, like the school where I'm at, you know, um, are open to a broader set of contributions. And then there are smaller uh, teaching schools where, you know, you, you basically just have to publish. Um, and so um, this, you, you know, and, and this um, require different publication strategies. Is there um, sort of a fail-safe publication strategy that you can use, you know, for example, during your PhD or during the first year of your careers that, um, uh, that can help you? Yes, there is, and I'll tell you what it is. So, in your pipeline, um, and I'm I'm talking to the, the 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 good schools, not the top schools, but the good schools like Isaac, right? So, on your pipeline, you need to have a category one or an ABS four, um, at least I would say at the very very least submission, ideally. Um, a first round revision, uh, first round revision resubmit. Now, category one, if you this is for the French list or ABS four. Um, if you look at the journals on these lists, there are a lot. Okay, it's not like it's top five, you know. So I mean, a lot like 10, 12, but you know, there is a number, right? So depending on how confident you are um, in your in your data and in your research. 
you know, you may uh, submit something uh, to one of the journals, I would say, um, sort of a year before you begin to apply for jobs, because, um, you know, a year will basically, nine months, uh, nine months will basically give the journal enough time to send you um, uh, an r and decision. And if uh, that decision is negative, you can send it to, to another journal and ev eventually still get an R&R because these are normally three or uh, four months. So that's that's a strategy. Obviously, if you can get something published, that'll be great. But, you know, we are looking at the paper that you have written in your first year and a half of your PhD to be realistic if you're on the job market on your fourth. Um, so, you know, I mean, there are people that are able to do that. Um, I was able to do that. But, you know, you, you need an exceptional set of circumstances. And I'm not talking about you being smart. I'm talking about you being lucky, working with the right people, um, you know, and getting lucky with uh, reviewers and editors and so on. I mean, you know, um, let's not fool ourselves thinking that academia is a meritocratic institution, right? So luck, luck matters everywhere. So, um, but that that would be the ideal obviously that you have a, a, a good piece polished um, so that's that's what you want to have so one r and r decision um, for a category one journal if you're applying to a top school you may either have literally nothing okay uh, many of my many uh, people that uh, left MIT in my program had nothing and they got hired at Harvard or even at MIT itself. Um, or, you know, we're talking uh, or revised resubmits or publications even in the very top journals, right? Um, if you don't, I mean, even in my time, which was 15 years ago, so now it's, it's completely forget it, um, you know, just don't bother applying to 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 a top institution unless you know it, you know you have like you know that your advisor tells you you know you're the second coming of Albert Einstein or Margaret Mead and um, you know and you pull it off um, because th just like you know Ariazeg which is a good school but not top school. We, we get applicants with, um, you know, with top journal publications out of, out of their PhD. Um, so top journal, I mean, you know, org science, that level of that level. So, yeah. Uh, so what you want to do is you get, you get uh, one R&R in the category one, ABS4, not one star and ABS4 star. So, you know, there's a, a, a bigger, um, there's a bigger, um, range of journals that you can submit to and then what what you want ideally is um, a couple of you know one publication one list station R in in a category two journal now the category two list is is big and you know and category two is is difficult to publish um, if your data are not good enough or, or if you're just writing a theory base, okay? Now, I have papers that I cannot publish in the category two, but that's because my data, my data are not good enough, okay? Um, so I'm not saying category two is easy mode, but if you have, you know, the type of data that you normally get during a PhD program, uh, I, 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 I think it's super doable to publish in a category two or ABS three. Right. I mean, the list is big um, and you need to be strategic. I mean, there are some journals that are uh, mis, uh, misqualified, um, you know, because they're field journals, for example, field journals that tend to be misqualified uh, in these lists. Uh, how do you know if a journal is misqualified? You basically see if this is in, um, if this is in the FT journal list, uh, an FT journal, a journal that is category two or uh, in the French list or category three in the ABS list, 
is probably misqualified. So, uh, you know, I won't send my weaker data theory pieces there because it's be, it will be super tough to, to publish. But, um, you know, I can definitely publish some, some Kateri 2s and, uh, you know, you, you should have a couple of that. W why do you need Kateri 2s? Well, because uh, most schools that are not the top, top schools have um, had experience with the past with faculty that came in with, like, with a super ambitious pipeline. So just starting the top, top journals and then uh, spent uh, um, several years without publishing. And obviously that is... Um, that is uh, something that you, you don't have to deal with uh, 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 at the school and uh, you you want to avoid that right so um, you also want to avoid that as a faculty person so you want to show to your prospective empl employers that you realize that you know you need a balanced portfolio um, to uh, to to succeed in academia also because you know it also shows that you're not you know sort of like uh, playing the system, you know, and, and this can be in a good way and in a bad way, right? Uh, so, but even let's, let's say, you know, in a good way, in a good way, if you're just publishing in very, very uh, top journals, then that basically means that you are leaving interesting data and interesting ideas by the wayside because your goal is to publish in top journals. Because, <coughs> you know, uh, most of my uh, category uh, two or category three papers, so ABS three and A ABS two, are from data from you know, for example, master's student thesis that are really really cool data that I really have something to say, but you know they're they're just not strong enough, right? And if I only ha if I only wanted to publish in the very top journals, then you know that requires seeing this really interesting data, these really interesting ideas, and say you know. I can't be bothered because, you know, as interesting and compelling as they may be, you know, they are not, uh, you know, at the level of this journal. So, you know, it just, it just may be misinterpreted as uh, that, you know, you put uh, <coughs> journal ranking over, uh, over, um, the craftsmanship of your work and obviously you know uh, there are people that will only work with with uh, top ranked data sets you know and that's fine um you know perfectly fine um and you know but that is something that you may need to make clear uh, in your job market interview and actually in your cover letter that uh, you know that is your approach and that you're not like simply sort of like um, um, you know focusing on journal prestige as the the key decision criteria for your your research um, research agenda right so um, so that's that's the first time the first criterion for a good pipeline so you need um, so the, the two first criteria you need uh, category one Revise and resubmit, ideally. If not, then at least a submission. Then you need a few category two, if yes, three um, revise and resubmits or even acceptances in uh, category two or ABS three uh, list, okay, to show diversity. Okay. Now, what happens if you're worried about signaling? What happens if you think that you can get into Harvard or MIT or Wharton? and um, you're worried about having category two. Well, if you are, there is a strategy that is, you know, it's very rough, it's very instrumental, uh, but it is a strategy that I've seen, so I'll just lay it out on the table and then it's your moral compass that has to decide whether you want to follow that strategy or not. And that strategy consists of being the last author in these papers, okay? So being the last author, tends to indicate that, you know, you, you sort of just like helped out, but um, you're not really like the, the driving force behind the paper. And so that basically signals that, you know, okay, you're, you're somebody who's open to help, to help out other people, but, you know, um, you won't be a lead author in, uh, in, in, in smaller journals. Uh, so that, that is something 
that um, that you can do if you want. And uh, but that's that's like re being super super aggressive in your in, in your public strategy. But you know, I have seen it done. It works. Okay. But again, this is only if you're trying to aim at the very top of the of the job market. Um, now, uh, there's also a matter of uh, co-authorship composition in um, in your papers that that is important. Um, if you're applying to the very top institutions, you need to be aware of the politics of um, uh, of the relationship among authors. For example, I uh, was uh, once had a difficult conversation during my PhD because I was co-authoring with somebody that um, people in my program had, um, you know, um, didn't like very much. They didn't like their research. Not that this was a nasty person, lovely person. They just didn't like this person's research. So I had a difficult conversation about this. And so if I was applying to, to MIT and um, I had papers co-authored with this person, then I could be in trouble. Uh, people really hate one another, especially at the top level across schools uh, sometimes. So you, you just need to be careful um, um, and mindful of that. doesn't mean that, um, you know, you shouldn't write uh, with uh, these people, but it just means that you need to be mindful of, uh, of uh, this uh, network ties, which are based on hate rather than, than like or friendship. Um, so that's for top schools. For, uh, for, for good schools, um, then, you know, you do want, what you want ideally is to have, in addition to uh, co-authorships with your supervisor, you want co-authorships with senior faculty outside your home institution and or and slash or you want co-authorships with um with people at your level so so junior scholars like you okay um why basically because this shows that you know you have a rich network and that you can work not only as an apprentice that's in your relationship with senior authors but also as a peer that's with your co-authorship with uh, with other uh, other junior uh, junior authors, right? So uh, this is super important. Um, somebody that only writes with their advisor, um, I don't say it's a red flag, but it would be it, it, if I, when I see CVs like this, I mean that that's become that becomes one of my key questions during the interview. So just be prepared to to discuss that because it is you know everybody knows that. It is really important. Everybody hiring knows that it is really important for you to have a, a support network of peers and of uh, senior scholars um, during your first few uh, publications. Now, you may be like me, who you know basically works on their own and definitely does not uh, enjoy working with senior scholars. That since my 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 PhD, um, so um, but you know but. You, you basically need uh, need um, need something, right? So, what what I always did is I I I try to organize um, like tracks in conferences and so on with uh, with senior scholars to show that okay, I do have this network. It's just that I don't use this network for papers. Um, so uh, there are ways of uh, of doing this. That uh, does not require co-authorship. Obviously, you know, not everybody's like me. Many people are happy with writing with senior authors. So, you know, if you do, just uh, uh, try to do that. The best way to do that is to visit another institution during your PhD program. Um, that's uh, an easy way to get co-authorships with our people because at that time you will have amazing data, and people are always happy to co-author with uh, amazing data. Um, with junior colleagues, I, you know. It's not necessary, but you know it does show some maturity that you don't, you can go beyond the apprentice uh, relationship in in co-authorships. So I'd say that's more of a, a bonus point than than not. Okay, so these are basically the the two key factors in in deciding what your pipeline looks like. Okay, and this is you know same thing when you're an assistant professor, right? When you're an assistant professor, you 
you, you need to keep in mind that you may want to apply to another institution later in life, like I did. Um, and, um, and when that is the case, then, you know, you need to, uh, you need to make sure that, uh, you have the right pipeline when your application goes through. So this is not just for PhD students. Okay. Um, so again, just to summarize the uh, two things that you need to pay attention are, uh, mixed composition. So one category one, ABS four, revise and resubmit at least, and then uh, a number of uh, category two ABS, uh, ABS three, that's composition. And then um, for um, co-authors, you want to have uh, at least one paper with co-authors outside, uh, s s senior co-authors uh, outside your institution or junior co-authors in your institution and or, um, uh, or outside. And these, you know, don't need to be accepted. They can be revised and resubmits. That's fine. Okay. Now, um, let's get back to the first point about the, diff the three levels of schools. So for top schools, what you want to show is papers in, in the very top journals. Everything else is like side projects or helping other people. Very good schools, excellent schools, just like um, ESAG. Um, you do want this uh, mixed portfolio, just as I described. For teaching schools, um, they're a little bit impressed by number of, of publications. So I'll, I'll focus on that. Um, the challenge there in teaching schools is that you want to think about what you want to do with your career. So if you are going for a teaching school because you want to work in teaching schools, you want to teach a lot and, and that's, that's where your passion lies, um, then that's fine. But if you, like I did, uh, went to a teaching school to have some time to develop my skills as a writer and to develop a nice portfolio, then, you know, you, you need to write for your next job, right? So you need to write, f for example, like I, I did always thinking that I would go to a, like a cool place like Isaac and so on, where you have, um, you know, a, like a nice set of category ones and then the category twos with people across. Um, uh, levels of seniority. Okay, so hope this was helpful. If um, the job market starting now, if you have any questions about the stock, uh, the job market, not stock market, job market, and uh, and you want some insights, um, uh, please feel free to um, drop a comment uh, in this video, and I'll I'm happy even to schedule a meeting and chat. Um, again, this does not represent how uh, hiring is done at ESAG. This is just my personal opinion from, um, you know, just speaking with people, being on job market and, um, and so on. But, you know, but I do think it is um, uh, a good set of insights that can help you out. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'll see you next week. Uh, by the way, um, Starting two weeks from now, so starting in November, I'm going to get back to streaming every day, but I will stream in Portuguese on Mondays and Wednesdays, and I will stream in Spanish on Fridays. Um, what I want to do is to make sure that uh, everybody has access to these videos. Um, you know, some scholars um, do not speak English and uh, you know, and in a way, by only doing these videos in English, I'm uh, contributing to uh, inequality uh, in academia, and I don't want to do that. So uh, some of the videos in Portuguese and Spanish, most of them will be uh, re getting back to some of my past videos on writing, but I will also have some new material. Okay, so um, again, have a great of um, a rest, a little, great rest of the week. That's it, and I'll see you next week. Bye bye.